Welcome to ADTV and today you join us with Phil Spinks and we're on the bank of the River Waveney and hopefully we're going to be showing you some winter chub fishing tactics. Now I know Phil we've had you out before in the summer and you've had some good fish on camera for us, certainly some decent chub but as conditions change and perhaps the water rises, colours up, you have to adapt your fishing style to get the best out of your sessions and I know personally there's a few whispers mate you've had some real big fish recently Couples over six, yeah, am I right? yeah, yeah. I've, I've been really pleased because I had a bit of a break from winter chub fishing, mainly just to do other things. You, you know, you don't get too much time to go fishing, and I have to sort of pick one thing or another. So I've been doing a bit of perch fishing, a bit of roach fishing, and um, now I climbed up in the loft and got the, <laughs> the chub rod back out and thought, um, yeah, it'd be really nice to do a bit of proper winter quiver tipping for chub again. Well, you've managed to do two fish in two weeks that I haven't ever done in a lifetime. So <laughs> you are certainly the man to talk us through this winter fishing. So before we go on to your rigs and the baits, I want to touch on with you, the most important thing for me is location. Yep. So where are you looking to go, especially this time of year when perhaps there's sort of rafts of weed and, and the colour of the water's coloured up, yep, yep. where I, are you going to go? I generally wait until we've had our first proper winter flood. I think it pushes all the, the dead weed out of the way and clears the river out and puts a bit of colour in it. As location, you've got your classic swims like your overhanging trees, yep. bends generally because there's just a bit more depth of water on the bends. Again, don't ignore that the long straight, the, this, it's happened so many times where I've fished them, especially just in the dark and got one bite on, on a, a straight that a lot of people would have just walked past. Yeah, I would. And it's, it'll be quite often be the biggest fish of the day. Don't know why they sit there, whether it's the angling pressure on the obvious swims pushes them out of them, but it's, uh, yeah, I, I, quite often like just for an hour or so in the dark on a bland straight for a big fish. So it's alien to me, I probably <laughs> wouldn't do it either, but get out there and try it, because like I said, I would just walk straight past that, find the nearest overhanging tree and try and catch an end. Potentially yeah. it'd be a smaller one there, but yeah. searching out these bigger ones, you never know, not always in those areas. No, no, it's, sometimes you, you want to get a bite, so you've got your, your banker spots. Um, I always say it's self-fulfilling. If you go out and fish a particular stretch one week and you catch a chub off that overhanging tree and you catch a chub on that bend, when you come back for your next trip, you probably go straight you know where back you to those swims. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and I think you have to sort of... I mean, one of the big fish I had last week, I've never had a bite in that swim, but it doesn't stop me from keep dropping in there and just trying my luck. It's, it's only... You've got to sit there for 20, 25 minutes just to... If the fish is in there, quite often the bite will come quite quickly. Yeah, a bit of trial and error, and that is just such a tiny little bit. It's going to be my next question. So it's quite important to travel light, and how long are you going to give it in each swim before you move it's, on? It's all relevant to the stretch that I'm fishing. If I'm, I've fished a few stretches where there's not many fish in there, but they're generally bigger, and I'll probably give it a bit longer in each swim. Um, sometimes you have to wait a bit longer for a bite because yeah. there's not that many chub there. Some of the spots where I know there's more chub, if I haven't had a bite in 20, 25 minutes, I'll quite often leapfrog down to the next likely looking spot. Um, it's kind of experience that tells you how long to sit in you certain sort of get swims. That feeling, yeah. yeah, there are places where I've sat in a swim for over an hour without a bite, and then you know a bite has come out of the blue, and they're quite often the bigger fish as yeah. well. I guess that just comes from experience and trial and error. But you can see there quite how quickly you're going to cover areas of water if you're leapfrogging. Sort of every 25, 20 minutes, you're going to get there, and hopefully you'll be finding some fish. So once you find these areas, Phil. You've got a couple of baits for you today that I'm guessing are your winter favourites. Yeah. You've got some cheese paste and some bread today. Yeah, yeah, cheese paste. I tend to use cheese paste either when I'm fishing in the dark or if there's a bit of colour in the water, just because it's so smelly. Dusty. You know, they, um, <laughs> yeah, the chubs soon find it in the coloured water. But I do really like using bread flake um, in conjunction with a little cage feeder with liquidised bread in it. I think when the water's got a bit of visibility, it just fishes yeah. really well. Um, the flake being super buoyant, it'll drift underneath reed wafts and you can you can position it where you want yeah. it that makes perfect sense and you've got a nice little tip on your cheese base i'm going to <laughs> give this away to all of you because uh, for me i used to wrap it around a cork wall to get some buoyancy into yeah. it but you've actually messed around with putting pop-up mix into your cheese base and yeah, making it yeah. At home. just you know just had a, a brainwave this year to, i wanted my cheese base to be buoyant like bread flake so i could drift it under snags and, and stretch the, the rig out nice and straight in the yeah. river um, so I put some pop-up base mix in with my cheese paste. Had to experiment a little bit with how much so it wasn't floating cheese yeah, paste. Yeah, yeah. It Just seems to have worked. You know, you know, yeah. I've had a couple of real good fish on it. Whether I'd have caught them if I wasn't using that paste, God knows. But um, in my head, you know, being able to cast close to a a weed reed waft or an overhanging tree and have that paste just float underneath it slightly. Yeah. It's just a bit more natural I guess isn't it? Yeah and yeah and with carp fishing we use wafting hook baits so when they pick it up 
it will go in the mouth further. Yeah. And I'm sure when a chub picks a buoyant piece of paste up, it will go further back in the mouth and you get a better hookup. Well, they do say that sometimes it's the simplest things that make the difference and I'm going to be doing that. So that's, a, that's definitely one coming for my armory in the future. But let's have a little talk about the rigs because you have kept it very simple, but you always seem for me, Phil, when I come at you, find a neater way of doing it. And although it is very simple, a little addition of a quick change link on there yeah. has made it really simple. So let's just talk us through exactly how you it's, rigged it. I just have, it's a, a real simple fixed pattern oster. I'll have quite a long hook link, which I attach to my main line with a five turn water knot. And then on the little tail where I'd hang my ledger or my feeder, I'll have a quick change swivel. Just means that if I want to suddenly put a piece of cheese paste on with a straight ledger, in 30 seconds you can clip the feeder off and a lead on or vice versa. And you can just change this setup really quickly with having a tiny knot saw. Yeah, it makes such a difference. Because each swim you could you potentially think, well, this is going to suit a bit of cheese paste. This is going to want a, a, a cage feeder with some yeah. crumb in it. And you just change it in seconds. Each, probably from each swim to swim you're changing. And, and I think a lot of people, myself included, you keep your fishing rods set up at home, yeah. ready to go. So whether I'm going in the daytime and I want to use liquidised bread in a feeder, or whether I'm going just into dark with cheese paste, the rod's set up and I just clip on whatever I want to use. Well, that makes perfect sense. But... I'm not going to keep you any longer because I know you've, you've pointed out a few eager spots you want to put a drop of bait into. So I'm going to let you get on with it and I'm pretty confident it's going to put a chub on camera for it. So <laughs> let's get on with it. Check that out for a picture. Two fish on the bank at once. Phil's had a bite. He's just resting one in the net and not to spook the shoal and put it back in front of him. And one more cast and it's gone straight away again. Like, yeah. come along like busters, two at once. But putting everything you said, mate, into practice, this is all the proof you need. And if you're out on the bank fishing this winter when other things are a little bit more tricky, get out there and give chub fishing a go.